Hey, this is Jonathan with Limitless Mindset, and I am here with my lovely wife, Gergana, and you can find the stream babe there on CastBox. If you go to the live cast area, you can find it, and you can say hello to anyone that drops in to listen to us. And today, I'm going to switch things up a bit. And I'm going to be reading an article. It's not that long. Oh, it'll, yeah. it'll only take me about 10 minutes to read the article. And the title of the article is Being Single is Hard. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who are single. And for some of them, it is very hard. And me and you have both spent quite a bit of our lives single, but now we're not. And I think we're going to perhaps have some good insight. Sorry about this quick interruption. I've got an important call to action for you. Please go watch this video and subscribe to Limitless Mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic, full-spectrum, anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. How are you doing today, babe? Oh, I'm pretty okay. Yes, our tummies are very, very happy at the moment because we just went out to a fantastic restaurant and we enjoyed what they had to, had to offer. The same thing that we did yesterday. So this article is on Medium and I will link to the article if anyone wants to check it out. And I found it particularly articulate and it makes some good points. It's written by someone named Emma Lindsay. So the article starts like this. At 5 a.m., after a night of drinking with strangers and pool and fireworks in the street and crappy pizza, I was sitting in the living room with two friends. One had a serious girlfriend and one like me had been single for a long time. Being single is really hard, I said. My friends and the girlfriend made a start as if to object the way people with girlfriends always object. But my single friend cut him off. Yeah, he said, being single is really hard. 
I don't talk about it often, except maybe very late at night or when I am extremely stressed out. But being single is hard in a way that people in couples tend to be highly dismissive of. If you're single and you complain about being single, you'll normally get some advice about learning to accept yourself before being able uh, to be with a partner. The current model is to work on yourself, uh, quote unquote, improve yourself when you're alone. And then when you're sufficiently unbroken, you will be able to attract a mate. To admit that you're unsatisfied being single is almost like an admission that you're not ready to be in a relationship. If you're not complete when you're alone, then you're not worthy of a partner. I believed in this model of singleness for years. I meditated, went to therapy and massage school, and did a bunch of hippie self-care stuff. I went on retreats. I took pay cuts in my professional life to have a more flexible schedule to do all these things. And it was totally worth it. I'm a lot happier and a lot more mentally stable now than I ever was. But I don't think it made me any more dateable. I had a minor breakdown chatting with a friend today. I'm going through a difficult personal situation I can't explicitly write about. And one of my friends told me, I think it's going to take you a while to process this. Maybe you shouldn't date for a bit. And I was like, what do you think I've been doing for the past two years? When I finished emotionally venting, I finally said, someone with a partner would have a person to lean on during this time. But for me, apparently, It's just another thing that makes me too broken to date. The thing is, I will never be whole. I will never be some sparkling example of human equanimity. I will never be someone who doesn't occasionally wake up in the middle of the night to cry. I can't unbecome the person my suffering has made me. You wouldn't be reading this if I hadn't lived the life that I lived. And that's fine. When I thought about my singleness more, I didn't think the people I knew in relationships were really much more mentally healthy than me. I don't think they're happier. I don't think they're better at work or even more or more even minded when adversity strikes. I think what happened is that Because of my sexual assault, I had a period of time that left me unable to form romantic connections with other people. A similar thing often happens to people struggling with addiction also, I suspect. Then being single actually made my life more difficult in various ways. It makes people uncomfortable to admit this. So they'll play it back to me like it's my fault. For instance, my friends often give me flack for not eating very healthily, though I feel compelled to smugly note uh, last time I had a blood panel workup, it was fucking spectacular. Plus one for uh, high fat, high sugar diets. They'll give me a hard time about grubbing fast food or eating out a lot. But then often all of them cook with their partners and exercise with their partners. It's easier to maintain a healthy lifestyle with a partner. Yet, if you're not healthy, this is seen as one of the many ways you could be undateable. And it's also seen as your fault. You didn't level up enough before trying to date. Similar arguments apply to saving money or maintaining your mental health. Truth be told, I didn't actually care too much about any of that. I've gotten my life to workable and that's fine. All that bugs me about it is there's a sort of reverse causality assumed about the whole thing. My partnered friends think because they were 
well put together, they attracted a partner. But I think having a partner makes it easier for them to be well put together. Thing is, I remember what most of them were like when they were single, and most of them didn't handle it well. And they didn't come to terms with being single and enter some magical state of Zen balance. Most of them found someone to date. And then after that, they found balance. But most people in relationships like to hold to the idea that they're fully functional alone. And so falsely push this be self-sufficient advice on single people. But anyways, the part I actually find hard about being single is that I never get touched. And this is always overlooked and undervalued. This is where the myth of self-sufficiency breaks down. For years, I totally bought into the myth of self-sufficiency. I had my own job. I paid for my own shit. I built up a community of friends. Like I am really good at being single. I did all the things healthy single people are supposed to do. In fact, some of my friends started complaining that I was too independent. I swear I can't win. But at the end of the day, I can't touch myself or I can touch myself, but it doesn't have the same impact as when someone else touches me. Did you chuckle when you read that because it sounded like I was talking about masturbation? That's not a coincidence. That is part of the problem. We don't even value platonic touch enough for it to exist in our lexicon without a sexual overtone. Most people in relationships have their need for touch met incidentally. But when you're single, it's very hard to get this need met. And I have it better than most. I am female. I do massage trades sometimes. I have the type of liberal friends I can talk to about this openly with, or liberal friends I'm even a little cuddly with sometimes. I have a cat, but like, my God, years of not being touched is fucking hard, and no one admits this. I think it makes us uncomfortable to admit our interdependence. No one ever says to single people, it may be worth being single for a while, but it is going to be a challenge going without physical affection. But I'd say that people condescendingly deride people who are afraid to be alone But in our society, some of our needs are only allowed to be met by a romantic partner. And I'm not talking about sex. Casual sex is totally fine in my social circles. I'm talking about affectionate touch. And it is completely reasonable to be afraid of not getting that. And in conclusion, she says, touch matters so much. Why do we keep acting like it doesn't? So I wanted to chat with my wife a little bit about this, get her feedback. And then if anyone here on CastBox would like to call in and chat with us, that's fine too. Babe, would you mind taking off your headphones? Sure. So... This article, it kind of uh, struck a chord with something that I've been thinking about, which is this whole mm, personal development dilemma that people arrive at, where if you're kind of woke about personal development, about yourself, you understand that it's, it's pretty important to kind of take care of yourself. And it's pretty important to go and reach a certain level of personal growth before you get in relationships. Because we have all maybe experienced, but we've all certainly seen 
when people are not personally developed at all, when people are still kind of in a lower state of consciousness, uh, maybe they're in bad health, maybe they're really impulsive, maybe they are still in the uh, in the grip of various vices, and they get into a relationship, and then all of their own personal dysfunction gets multiplied by the other person that they're in a relationship with. And then a lot of times they have children uh, in a dysfunctional relationship, sometimes multiple children. And then all of that dysfunction they have, it gets multiplied again in their children. And this is (laughs) this whole dynamic, this whole reproducibility of dysfunction and abuse and trauma is kind of what's at root at everything that's really that's really wrong with the world. And so this woman is obviously kind of like a what would we call a person with a long time preference. This is obviously kind of a a person that's thinking about the future And she was like, okay, I'm single and I'm actually pretty good at being single and I'm going to do a bunch of personal development so that I can kind of be more worthy of a relationship and have a better relationship in the future and maybe be a good parent in the future. But this personal development sounds like it kind of ended up just being kind of a masturbatory thing and it didn't actually get her much closer to her goal. And it's really, it's really kind of sad. So it makes you kind of think that there's maybe a minimum level of personal development that people should devote themselves to before, before they are, before they are willing to get into relationships with other people. It, it kind of seems to me that there's people out there, you can just put that around your neck. That's mm-hmm. fine. Just put it around your neck. Like I put mine around my neck. There you go. Okay. It it seems like people are probably spending uh, years and a not insignificant amount of effort doing all these personal development things, which is, which is awesome. I'm a huge, huge advocate of personal development. And we try to do all of the personal development and health kind of stuff that, that, that we, that we can, but there's this innate human need deep, deep, deep within our genes to uh, move into a relationship, to uh, move towards parenthood. And when people delay that, they seem to, they, they, they seem to forfeit the happiness that they've been doing so much damn personal development work to get a little bit closer to. And it's, it's complicated. It's, it's tough. What do you think? Oh, yes, I do agree with everything that you have just said. And you should heal yourself first before stepping into a new relationship. I agree with this too. Mm -hmm. And you should not have a, You should not have a luggage with you from past relationships before you get into a new one. Mm -hmm. How do you think you know when you've done enough of dealing with your... How do you think you know when you've done enough healing that that you can move on, that you're ready? Well, when you don't feel so much pain anymore and when you're more focused on the future than on the past oh okay okay or the present you know when you're more focused focused on the present or the future or both then you're focused on the past because people who have an emotional trauma you know kind of a fresh trauma in their head or their heart or heartache or something they just tend to look back and walk down memory lane a lot more often than people who don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. So do you think it's more important to be focused on the present or the future? Present. Yeah, you're probably, 
write about that. What do you think a woman like this could do differently? Or maybe even a man too, because some a lot of what she, some of what she says is specific to women, but a lot of what she says also kind of generalizes to everybody. Well, first of all, I don't know what her standards are, but a lot of women have very high standards for a man's looks. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of women think that he should be tall, dark, handsome, to have blue eyes and uh, be like like a movie star or with very big muscles, you know. Really fantastic hair like I have. Believe me, a lot of women don't really care about the hair as much as they care about the muscles. I don't believe it. (laughs) I don't believe it. That's why. That's because you have really fantastic hair. Check out the pictures of me on the internet, guys, if you have not He doesn't use shampoo, guys. I don't use shampoo because Alex Jones told me not to. And it's the best. Because Rouge V told him not to. Well, both. Both Alex Jones and Rouge V told me about the evils of shampoo. And I gave it up five years ago. And my hair has never had such a fantastic, lustrous sheen to it but his his hair is just very curly and very thick believe me guys um it's just jeans a really great jeans because his mom's hair is awesome i have a lot i have a lot that Mm -hmm. i owe that i owe to my that i owe to my mother but let's not get too sidetracked on my hair you know that'll be that'll be another podcast that we do entirely about about biohacking hair about your hair yes so entirely about jonathan so let's <laughs> let's let's talk about the standards just mm-hmm. just just a bit more and yeah okay standards are important uh standards are They're like are super important in life but i think that i think that people um deny themselves a lot of a lot of love and a lot of happiness that's out there because they have somewhat unrealistic standards. Um, And I think that if you're, I I think that people, both men and women should probably lower their standards in the, 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 this is my idea. I think that people need to maybe lower their standards a little bit with the opposite sex, with the people that they're trying to attract, and that they need to raise their own standards when it comes to aesthetics when it comes to when it comes to beauty and i'm not uh i do think beauty is beauty is important uh it's be- a very subjective thing though it's it's somewhat subjective it's it's somewhat subjective but beauty is also uh refl- beauty is a a thing that are that exists because of our genes so uh beauty is not quite as subjective as you know what type of flavor of ice cream that, that people like, you know, uh, beauty exists because our, because it results in our, our, our reproductive process Mm -hmm. working. And so I think that people should probably have lower standards, a a little bit lower standards. I mean, you don't, you don't want to, you know, you don't, you don't want to date people that are, that are atrocious looking or that are wholly unattractive. You want to date people that you find attractive, but I think you want to have more, a bit more flexibility with, with that. But I think where people, you should not have a type like tall, dark, and handsome. I don't date other guys. Mm-hmm. For example, that, or I, I'm only into... Babe, babe, you don't need to talk quite so loud when you're right next to the microphone. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. Anyway. That's okay. You're doing good. Okay. Or I only want a big boobed, long-legged, blonde, blind one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of unrealistic and ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you you can't demand a top 5% or a top 10% person of the opposite sex if you're not really in the top 5%, top 10% yourself in attractiveness, right? Mm-hmm. 
But I think where people should maintain really high standards is when it comes to virtue. Yes, when it comes to virtue and character and it, beauty. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's where people need to have really really high standards because the the beauty thing the beauty thing uh, wanes particularly yeah, per- uh, particularly with with women. Women have kind of a window of beauty that's in between about 18 and about 35 years old when they're beautiful. Let's say 40. Yeah, yeah, maybe 40. Maybe 40. Look at Melania Trump. Yes, yes, there's there's Melania. She's like 52 and she's she's still pretty, pretty attractive. Um, and then men, and then with men, their beauty also wanes a little bit, a little bit less. Uh, slowly, you know, every once in a while you'll get like a uh, Tom Cruise type guy that is still pretty good looking until he's like 60, but really with men. Or Keanu Reeves. Or Keanu Reeves. He kind of looks homeless in some of the pictures I see of him. No, he, he can look very hot if he wants to. Yeah, even, yeah. Even at this age. Yeah, yeah. And some yeah. some women are into the homeless look, you know. Or Johnny Depp. Or jo- Johnny Depp also looks homeless to me in a lot of his photos. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I will never into Johnny Depp. So I would say that the that the the flexibility with standards can allow a lot of people to escape the escape this escape the singleness. And while we're while we're talking about looks, okay, so this woman is really frustrated. She sounds like she's really being totally eaten up by being single. And there's kind of a hard truth to this. There's one very small photo on medium.com of this woman. And I couldn't find any photos of her elsewhere on her uh, Facebook or social media profile. And almost always when women are pretty attractive or when women take some pride in their looks they you know pay attention to their looks they'll post a lot of photos of themselves on social media you can if women are taking some pride in their looks they they are almost always not going to be hiding it on social media and so in her photo that she has of herself here she is not she's not ugly but she looks like she's she she looks totally uh non outstanding she has kind of a kind of a boyish look for, look to her um she's got kind of kind of a short boyish hairstyle and so i think in this case i think emma is probably ignoring the really obvious part of getting out of singleness, which is that you you have to be really attractive. And if you're a heterosexual, you you have to be attractive in kind of a traditional sort of way. If you're if you're a man and you're single and you're frustrated with being single, well, you need to go and hit the gym. You need to lose those extra pounds that you might have on your belly. If you're if you're a man, often you don't pay quite enough attention to the details and the nuances and the subtleties of your aesthetics and style. If if you're a man and you're single and you're frustrated, you can actually it, it's surprising how much you can improve your chances of landing a date, getting a girlfriend. If you do a serious wardrobe update, you know, I do consulting with, uh, I do dating consulting with guys from time to time and they can really get a lot of, it's really a high leverage area of personal growth to go and drop some coin on just getting like some real fly clothes. So they look really great. And then also maybe, you know, spending some more time hitting the gym, getting themselves a little bit more trim, maybe putting on a bit of muscle. When you're doing a lot of uh, fitness things and you're getting your hormones right and you're getting all the toxic crap out of your diet, your face changes. Your face becomes a lot more symmetrical. And this is something that makes you a lot more attractive. And so 
I, I got the impression from taking a look at some of this woman's other content on social media that she's kind of in this whole uh, feminist paradigm where they are kind of anti-femininity, where they're kind of encouraging women to just just dress like really, really casual. And I guess that's I guess that's okay, but not if you're really frustrated with being single. If you're a woman and you're single, similar to be a man, you can really improve your chances, improve your likelihood of uh, landing a partner by a whole lot if you embrace femininity. You know, go out and get a really nice hairstyle, go hit the mall, get the nicest feminine clothes that you can wear. And I'd be willing to bet that that would actually, I'd be willing to bet that that's kind of the thing that Emma here is not, is not trying. Because again, women, when they really pay attention to their appearance, they post photos of themselves all over the internet. They make it, they make it really obvious. So the, the beauty, beauty is a, uh, beauty is a riddle. Beauty is a, uh, this multifaceted, sometimes paradoxical part of our, of our human experience and of our experience of love. And, in, and, and in one sense, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be totally focused on beauty. You don't want to be totally shallow about it, but, uh, beauty exists for good reason. Beauty is the, uh, beauty is the entryway to, uh, to finding real love that's out there. So I urge people that are single and frustrated about it to, just, well, just beauty is not enough, John. Yeah, 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 of course. Of course. But I think that especially single people should really probably worry about their own looks quite a bit more and 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 do be a li- be a bit more conscious about sculpting themselves, their body, their aesthetics into an ideal that is going to make them attractive to the opposite sex. Yes, that's true, but you can be naturally beautiful. And if you're not a decent person, uh, this will definitely not be enough. Yeah. Uh, and there's this whole, there's this phenomenon that everyone, every, everyone has experienced this in their dating life where they go and date someone that's like really, really attractive. They date someone just because they're good looking. And then they discover that they have an awful character. And a, a, a lot of times some of the, most catastrophically bad relationships result because <laughs> people were just making their selection based upon looks. Yes, exactly. Well, years ago, I had this experience with, uh, you know, a really naturally hot guy. I did him for like a few months just because I was attracted by his looks, but then it turned out that he was extremely dumb. (laughs) Super dumb. And basically he didn't know what to say to any of my questions. And almost every time I would ask him a single question, he would be like, I don't know. So over time I started calling him, I don't know, man. And uh, soon (laughs) afterwards, I just broke up. Okay. You know, good decision. Yeah, I was still attracted to him, uh, you know, on the outside, but I was like, I cannot have a relationship with such with such a person. It's just not worth it. <laughs> you know. Hmm. So the 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 thrust of the article is that she's she's really frustrated. She says she's done a lot of personal development stuff. She said she did uh, meditation. She's done some, uh, she, she said she did some hippie self-care things. Mm-hmm. She said she did therapy and she is, she's and she's better as a result of these things. She says she's better, but she hasn't become more dateable. And I think particularly for women, uh, women get this, this time window, which again, it's in between about 18 and 35 years old. 
and they get this, this golden, golden, about 17 years, about 17 years, they have this golden time window when they are dateable in a word, when their, uh, when their natural sexual market value, as they call it, is going to be at its peak. It's actually at its peak closer to, you know, about 18 years old. And then it uh, declines pretty predictably over that time. And so I think with a woman like this, and it sounds like she, she said she had some sort of sexual assault, something terrible happened to her. Uh, and that's really sad. Uh, you know, that's that's really terrible when that happens to people. But I'm getting the impression, and I, I get this impression from talking to a lot of people, that there's, that there's a lot of, uh, especially women out there, who are going to spend, who within that time window, that 18 to 35 time window, they spend their time doing a lot of things other than, than doing dating, than trying to find a good partner. Um, they devote a lot of energy to their careers, uh, to maybe their educations. And then they will do these different personal development things, which are which are, which are, you know, which build confidence and that sort of thing. But the clock is tick, 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 ticking that whole time. And as those, as those years pass, they're going to become less and less dateable, even if they're doing a lot of good things, even if they're doing a lot of good personal development things. So I think, I think there's maybe a difference in between the the sexes in this area i think that with men we have a window that's a bit bigger but i don't i'll explain later i don't think it's that i don't think it's that much greater uh but particularly with women they have this window of time when they can meet a really great guy who's going to commit to them and settle down with them and have a family with them and then once they're getting, you know, closer and closer to 35 or after 35, then they're kind of out of luck. And I think this is kind of one of these truths that a lot of times our, our culture forgets to tell us nowadays because of political correctness. And I think it's really sad because a lot of women spend their time doing other things. They hear about personal development and they say, oh, personal development sounds good. I'm going to, you know, maybe maybe I'll spend like, uh, you know, two years, maybe I'll spend like five years really doing my personal development. And then I'll be really, really ready to be in a great relationship. And then maybe I can have a family and it's all going to work out really well. But they're not, but they're naive or they're just totally uninformed that they, they just got this window. And then, oh, very funny, very funny, babe. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then things shut down after that. Oh, well, it's a really, I don't totally agree with you. I mean, even women after 40 years old, they can find love if they're single. But they should just uh, look harder, mm -hmm. you know, just like your mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your mom was uh, older than 40 when oh, she yeah. met her second husband, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. Or your dad's second wife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they have been very happy since. Mm -hmm. So it's not impossible for the women after 40 to find love mm -hmm. and be happy. But I think uh, my parents' uh, second marriages are probably uh, statistical aberrations. I think I think that's probably a whole lot less likely. I think it's I think it's a whole lot more likely that the longer you wait, the more the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Well, that's basically correct. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible. Yeah. 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 It's not it's not impossible. You know, every once in a while you'll see <laughs> you'll see some uh like news story about like two old people that were like 85 years old that met each other in a, in a, a old person's nursing home or something like that. And they, they fell in love at 85 and then they got married at 90 and then a 
I don't know, one of them died five years later or something like that. You see news stories like that. Um, so it's so it's certainly not imp- so it's certainly not impossible. But I I also when I talk to uh, men that I'm doing dating coaching with, I always I always urge them. I'm like, dude, stop stop procrastinating. <laughs> stop stop procrastinating with you know trying to find a great woman that you can share your life with because yeah a lot of times I'll I'll be talking to these guys they'll find me through my website limitless mindset and they'll be like oh man I'm doing all these awesome personal development personal growth things you know I'm doing my biohacking I'm going to the gym I'm working on some type of cool entrepreneurial kind of thing. I'm doing meditation. Doing meditation. Fasting. I'm fasting. I'm going to like go and travel around the world. And I don't drink. Moment. Don't drink. Well, so, a lot of times they drink. <laughs> yeah. But, but sometimes they do, you know, intermittent uh, sobriety. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk to these guys and they're doing, they're doing like all these, all these cool personal development things. And they are a lot of times, I don't know, a lot of times they're like an average age of like 30 or something like that, which is, that's kind of around the age where a lot of men start getting like really serious about doing personal development type stuff. And, and I tell them, I'm like, dude, stop procrastinating so much with trying to find a good woman because this is the thing as a man, you do have a larger sexual market value window, you know, your sexual market value window, it might, might stretch out to like maybe 50 years old. Maybe, maybe if you're, if you got like good genes and you're like doing all the anti-aging hacks, your sexual market value is going to stretch out to like maybe 50 years old, maybe longer, but maybe a whole lot less. Your sexual market value window might only, you know, it might only stretch out to about 40 years old as a man. And you're going to be uh, putting all of your energy and all of your time into all these different personal growth type things, which is which is cool, which is certainly rewarding. Uh, but you you need a certain you need a certain youthful energy to uh, court women and seduce women and enjoy women and. All, so I'll be talking to these guys that are like 30, that are like 30 years old. Maybe they're like 32 years old. Maybe they are 33 years old, whatever. And I'm, t- I'm telling them, I'm like, dude, after you get to be about 35 years old or a little bit older than that, you're not going to want to, you're not going to be quite so motivated to engage in this youthful dance of seduction. You're not... Y- when you're dealing with women and you're dealing with trying to find a good woman, you you have to have a certain uh, childishness about you to to engage in the courtship process with women. And if you're like a hardcore personal development bro, you're you know like hitting the gym at six a.m. every morning, and then you're doing some modafinil and you're staying up till midnight every night, hustling, doing your online business, you're going to get yourself into like this really kind of like stoic, classic, manly, masculine type of mindset. And when you spend five years, 10 years doing that, you're not going to quite have that, that childish playfulness that you need to have to, uh, to find, to date a woman, court a woman and move the relationship closer towards having a family. So I think that both men and women, but probably women especially, need to be just a bit more aware of the tick, 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 ticking time that is that is going away. They need to be a bit more aware of those, uh, of the sand of time that is passing through the hourglass of their life and that they should probably prioritize their dating uh, sooner rather than later. Okay, you have something to say? Yes, I wanted to say that a lot of young men are scared of serious relationships. Do you think so? Yes, a lot of young men are scared of 
marriage and they're they're just very skeptical of women mm -hmm. and they just feel like being promiscuous. Mm -hmm. That and that's that's kind of natural, right? Mm. It's not supposed to be natural. Mm -hmm. You're urging them to form families, but they're like Oh, I don't know. I kind of don't trust women, you know. Women are bitches. Women want just, you know, my money or they want to use me. Um, I have been cheated on before. I'm not sure if I want something serious. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys think like this. Even you did before you met me. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Before. Well, when I was, when I met you, around the time that I met you, that's when my mindset was kind of changing mm -hmm. around women because up until then I had the, the pickup artist mindset where I was, you know, more interested in kind of being promiscuous and being slutty <laughs> and I was, uh, frankly, uh, I was frankly afraid of women because, um, especially all, almost all the friends of mine that I grew up with there in Denver, Colorado, they all had these, uh, disastrous, disastrous relationships with, with, with women. And so it, uh, yeah, it really kind of turned me off towards, you know, the idea of having more serious relationship. Yeah, that's my point. Hmm. How can you convince a young guy in his uh, 30s who is very afraid of having a serious relationship with a woman and forming a family to start one and stop being afraid? Hmm. Yeah, that's kind of... That's kind, that's kind of tough. I'm not sure. I think that perhaps George Martinez mm -hmm. has some insight on this. Okay. But I want to make sure that our Wi-Fi connection is working. And it looks like maybe our Wi-Fi connection has gone down. So I'm going to turn on the Wi-Fi on my phone. Do you want to check? Do you want to put your headphones on for just a minute and sure. see if you can still hear me to see if the feed is still going? And George, if you're still listening, yeah, we can have you, yes, I can hear you call now. in if you want to chat, uh, if you want to chat with us for a minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, George, call in. Hello. Hey. Hello. What's up, man? Hello. Uh, how's it going? Hi, George. Hi. Hello. Uh, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Can you hear him, babe? Yes. Oh. So. Okay. Cool. So I was just wondering. Uh, I was just um, checking in. Oh, oh you can't hear I me? know what the issue is. I need to turn off oh. my. Hey, George. Hello. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, bummer. Okay. You want to answer that? Yeah, I was just getting a little bit more curious, though, because I've always thought about this and I've listened to the yeah. kind of podcasts. Tell, tell him to go ahead. Yeah. But I actually I actually can't hear him. Oh. So let Should me... I wait? Okay, Should I ahead. wait so he can... Okay, I'll go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, I think there's not that much of convincement, you know. Sometimes, as a young man myself, you know, I'm in my early 20s. I also got afraid about a serious commitment. But the thing that made me change opinion was when I met a certain type of woman that made me change my whole idea around women. Now, you say that a lot of men are afraid of actually being in a committed relationship, and that's true. But sometimes it's just the type of men that you've encountered, that you've encountered. Like For example, you like a certain type of men, you always you know, go towards that kind of men. And those are the usually kind of men that are afraid of a relationship. You have to expand a little bit more your your 
I'm not sure. I, I don't know how to say it though, but you should expand a little bit more your vision, you know, see past a, a couple of things, experiment with different kind of people that usually you wouldn't um, go with. But it's just kind of the thing of living, you know, you, you fail, you pick yourself up and you keep doing those things. But in my case, I was afraid of commitment because the girl, the women I was around with, they were just not the type of women that you would always see as yourself in the future. Now, right now that I'm a uh, committed relationship and I'm still pretty young, but I could see myself in the long in the long run with this kind of uh, type of person who made me change my perspective. So, the women always have a big influence over the men, and if you could show someone that you're ready for a committed relationship, not pressuring them, but that you're open to a committed relationship, you could maybe change the ideas of this person and just show them that it's not so bad. And obviously, I'm not saying no, pick up the pace and show them or bring them to a world right away. You have to almost baby step us through your world of having a committed relationship, having a future with you. You know, so that's what I think that in the society we live in right now, it's kind of the hardest things that you could propose to a man just because of everything that's going on. And also women should be spectacle, uh, spectacle over men because there's so many men that just play with women. Um, like some people say stand up. Um, I'm not sure I, what you guys said before, but it was more of a pickup artist. There you go. Some men are just pickup artists. It's just a one time thing. And you guys should kind of see through that and see beyond that because women are really, really smart and just don't go towards that kind of men, you know, go for a different type of men. And obviously show us what you want. We'll show you what we want, but it has to go from both parts. Me being a person that's more, um, you know, shy and that kind of thing. When someone goes inside my world and then offers me to go inside their world, yeah, I have to. Because I enjoyed the time that we spent, and that brings up to a bigger horizon. I'm not sure what you think. Is so he I'm, talking? Uh, uh, yeah, yes. I'm not sure what you think. Oh, okay. You could maybe gather. Um, we could talk about this. Do you could apologize. Show me your perspective. My for some reason I don't have audio input. That's fine. He can't hear you, but the podcasting is recording, so he will listen to it later. Oh, yeah, gotcha. Uh, okay. Bummer. It would appear that my audio setup is uh, not quite sufficient to take call-ins. I'm sorry about that, guys. That's okay. You can tell them it's okay. That's fine, George. You can keep going. Oh, yeah. Well, that was pretty much what I, all I needed to say. It was just because, um, you know, it, it's something, it's a situation that comes out, out of mostly it's men insecurities, mostly. But all of this just has to be with going hand with hand, you know. As you show me your insecurities, I can show you my insecurities. And so both of them don't look as as much. It doesn't it doesn't seem as a problem anymore. And that's what we should be talking about with women and men. 